I'm going to spend the next hour or so in walking through first uh, what active visibility means. And um, we'll start off with some basic principles to uh, make sure that we're all level set and using the same terminology. And then as we step through it, walk through higher la la layers of the stack, uh, talk about some of the traffic intelligence in terms of how we help solve customer needs. So I'm responsible for product management, and my partner in crime today would be Noam Sirkin, uh, who will demonstrate some of the things that um, I'm going to be talking about. So first, today's topic was about active visibility. I'm going to use the same picture that Peter showed and kind of walk through what we mean by active visibility. This is a traditional data center architecture, and it's just used to represent a network. It's by no means intended to suggest that this is only for data centers. Okay, <laughs> But what you see here is um, typically customers have a need from the point of view of their visibility needs to have access to data sources. And that access to data sources comes from taps in physical networks. And those uh, traffic sources get fed into visibility nodes. Now, there are a lot of players in the market. And I would contend that this is where the similarity stops. Right? If you step through this, what we have is a full portfolio of solutions which allows you to acquire traffic in the most efficient way possible. So if you want to be doing you know, pervasive visibility across a large data center, a mega scale data center, we've got solutions for that. It's called as the TA1. Now maybe you want to have an efficient way to aggregate all those traffic sources into kind of a core node where you want to do certain traffic intelligence before it is shipped off into the destination devices that want to consume the data. And that's where the HC2 or the HT8 modular form factors come in. Okay. Now you may also have certain remote sites where you don't actually have the ability, um, either from the point of view of uh, sheer economics or from the point of view of manpower, to have remote tools available in those sites. Right? So you want to have access to the ability to acquire data from a remote site and send it back to your central farm where you're doing all of your security analysis or your operational analysis. We can do that, and we feed that back into the same visibility fabric. And then these are the typical destinations that you would see in terms of what the customer wants to do with that specific data that they acquire. Sometimes they want to be doing voice over IP analysis. If they're a service provider, they want to be doing customer experience management because they are responsible for providing service level or meeting service level agreements to their customers. If you are uh, responsible for applications, you're responsible for application performance management. So that's what you'd be, you'd be caring about. And then there are also situations where sometimes you want to scale up your security systems in line, especially for challenges that are being faced today by organizations in terms of intrusion protection as well as threat detection in real time. And that can't be done out of band, which is what happens in these situations, but actually needs to happen in band. So those are, again, situations where you would feed it into the same visibility fabric, and you have the ability to do these operations in band. And last but not the least, which is very important, this is not just about physical infrastructure. We all know that more and more traffic is becoming east-west, especially in highly virtualized environments, which means I should have the ability to capture this traffic from virtual servers, from virtual machines as well, and feed that into the same visibility fabric. The point here, folks, is very simple. We're talking about pervasive visibility here. I don't care where you want to get the traffic from, I'll get that to you. On-prem or off-prem? Physical or virtual, you'll get that. And what is most important here is it's not just delivering a fire hose to you, because that would be dumb tapping and aggregating the traffic and delivering that to you. Rather, it's applying the necessary traffic intelligence before delivering the traffic to you. So these things that you see here that are represented by small icons, I recognize you probably can't see it, but they refer to deduplication, net flow generation, masking, adaptive packet filtering. We'll go into the details of that. Those are examples of traffic intelligence which are applied before the traffic is delivered to the destination. For NetFlow, are you saying you can be a NetFlow collector? Or? We can be a generator of the NetFlow records. And so you span data to your box or a tap it to your box, yes. and then you'll generate NetFlow data from there? Yes. And I'll go into more details about that 
um, you know, when, when that slide comes up. And I think, Noam, you're also going to be doing a demonstration of that. Okay. Just, just NetFlow, or what about some of the alternate types like IPFIX? NetFlow slash IPFIX both. Yeah. Let's say NetFlow will do the new 5.9 or IPFIX. Or if you set up the format. Okay, so with that in mind, um, the first topic that I want to address is why is this different from TAP and AG? Why is this different from TAP and aggregation? A common question that comes up is, hey, can I just reuse an Ethernet switch to address these needs that uh, administrators have? And to answer the question, I would go back to what the management guru, Clayton Christensen, often says. You got, you got to ask the question always, what is the job that your customer wants to get done? What's the job that our customers want to get done? They want to get visibility in order to meet a specific operational need or a specific security need. That's the job that they want to get done. They're not looking for tapping traffic everywhere. They're not looking for aggregating traffic everywhere. They're looking for visibility to meet a specific need. And that's a very, very important thing that I want to highlight here. So let me step through this, what I call as a seven stage chevron, to talk about the various essential components of delivering visibility. First and foremost, as I mentioned before, you need to have the ability to get access to traffic irrespective of where it comes from. It could come from a physical source, from a virtual source. It needs to be securely tapped so that there's role-based access control, and you want to prevent unauthorized access to it. And if you're in a virtual environment, one of the key differences is that you're co-resident with the application. So you have to be very sensitive in terms of being non-intrusive, and you also want to make sure that you can automatically respond to vMotion events. In a physical infra infrastructure, there's no you know, um, uh, changes that, that happen as much as in a virtual infrastructure. So you've got to be much more sensitive to changes in workload patterns and changes in terms of where those workloads are located. Number two, header filtering. This is a fairly basic thing. You, go, you want to filter off the packet headers and send that in a normalized way to the destination tools, which are consumers of, device, of, of the information, so that they don't need to understand what the specific details of the encapsulation are. It doesn't matter if you're tapping into an MPLS WAN link, for example. The tools don't need to understand MPLS headers. Maybe you want to strip off the Q and Q headers. Maybe you want to strip off the GRE headers. Uh, so that's the basic header filtering. But beyond that, many times you have a need for deep packet filtering. right? So increasingly, with the use of um, network virtualization concepts, the actual payload gets hidden behind certain outer layer encapsulations, VXLAN being a classic example of that. You may also want to be looking for certain specific patterns so that you can be doing application-based filtering. And when I talk about application-based filtering, not layer two to layer four, but actually layer two to layer seven. Right? Next. You also want to be looking at packet optimization. Don't forget that the job that the customer wants to get done is to have an efficient way to have visibility into the infrastructure. Many times the fundamental thing that we have to remember here is the tools have got very high semantics. They're very rich in intelligence, but don't necessarily operate at the same speed as the network. So there has to be the translation middleware layer so that only relevant data is being, is being given to it. Sometimes that relevancy is enhanced by timestamping the traffic. Sometimes it's enhanced by slicing the traffic because all the information that I need is in the first 256 bytes of the packet, so I don't care about anything else that's there in the packet. Sometimes you also need to mask off sensitive information for compliance reasons. You may have a voice over IP team in your, in your, um, uh, in your, in, in your team, um, and they, um, you don't want them to be looking at who is calling whom. Right? That's a compliance thing. Um, maybe you want to be looking at you know, big data, but you don't actually want to be processing credit card numbers that should be visible for, for some of the compliance teams. Can, you, can you store teams. any of this data like natively in your solution? No. Nothing is stored. It's actually you know, uh, processed, and then afterwards it's sent off to, uh, to the destination. Of course, apart from any, any of the configuration information. Yeah, what I'm saying is, like, if there wasn't any tools plugged in, mm -hmm. like you know, is there in terms of if you set up any sort of like filter or compliance, you know, mechanism or what have you, you know, are are there things that can still be used for 
reporting or just no. again it's processed and that's it yeah you, you have a way to uh, to generate netflow records um, and that right. way that's a summarized you no know, okay. view that could be that could be generated okay. Okay. But the goal here is to reduce the bandwidth overhead in terms of what is actually coming towards the, the recipients of the information. Now this is a very important part, which is stateful correlation. A lot of what we've talked about so far is at a packet by packet le level, right? But when you really think about traffic intelligence, we need to stop thinking about packets, we need to start thinking about flows, we need to start thinking about sessions, right? Subscriber sessions, and the best example for this is in a mobile network. Now, every mobile network today is built upon the GTP protocol, GPRS tunneling protocol. And one of the things that we often forget is that GTP is constructed in such a way that there's a separation between the control plane and the user plane. So in order for a mobile provider who cares about providing a high SLA to consumers like you and me, they need to be able to correlate the traffic between the control plane and the user plane before they can understand all the traffic for a particular subscriber. <coughs> so that inherently means understanding state. Another example could be deduplication. Um, if you're tapping from multiple places in the network, guess what? Chances for duplicates are going to increase. You don't want to be sending all of those duplicates to the tools. You actually want to reduce that so that way you get a better uh, efficacy from the tools. We'll talk about flow view later on. So this is a very important part in terms of not being stateless, but actually being stateful at a flow and session level. High performance net flow. Again, now this is a great way in terms of centralizing net flow record generation across your network. What happens if you're using white label switches in your network infrastructure? What happens if you're using non-Cisco switches and routers in your infrastructure? Or what happens if you're using Cisco switches and routers in the infrastructure, but that gets overloaded when net flow gets enabled? So those are kind of problems that can be avoided by centralizing NetFlow, and it's a very, very high performance NetFlow engine that we have, which is highly scalable. We'll talk more details about that in a minute. <clears throat> and last but not the least, if you recall in that picture on active visibility that I showed, inline capabilities is an important part. The first six are all um, out of band, right? Are, are typically, I should say, used out of band. But the inline um, um, capabilities are a great way to scale up the performance and efficacy of your in-band uh, tools, such as intrusion protection in particular. And increasingly, there is more and more of security devices, especially for threat detection and intrusion protection, that are being deployed in line because of all the things that we read in the papers. So these are the various you know, seven stage steps that I see are important. And once you've done all of these things, it's important to have a unified view across all of these things that are being done in the visibility infrastructure so that way you're not doing a box by box kind of view or a node by node kind of view. You have a uniform pane of class across which you could view all of these things. Can you elaborate about the, on the packet filtering slide yeah. a few slides ago? You said uh, filtering on layer seven criteria, mm -hmm. so application, yes. whatever. It's not really packet filtering at that point, right? Because you, you have no layer seven from one packet. Yeah. You can't tell what's going on. Is this, I'm looking for an application and then I pick out flows and, and filter those? So, so the best way that? I would explain that is think of it like, um, like a grep, right? So you could search you know, based on a regular, regular expression pattern. And when you find the pattern, you would only send the traffic to the tools and nothing else. So, well, Maybe I see some TCP payloads, but I never see yeah. the X because they're empty, or, or what do you mean? So, so um, you can look for uh, any specific patterns that are there um, in, in the payload, but that's done on a packet-by-packet basis. Okay, so it's still packet-by-packet. Packet. Correct. So if a but you're not constrained to layer 2 to layer 4 boundaries. You can look anywhere in the packet for that specific pattern. If the data is segmented by TCP, can my, can my grep span multiple segments? You want to answer that, Dominic? Well not, well, not currently, but that's part of a session-based APF, which allows you to, we, we do have the ability to keep track of state of, of flows, and so at some point we can add that capability so that once you detect a flow has 
uh, a particular tag in it or a particular um, username or something like that, then have that flow be sent to a particular tool. So, so I mean, you know, if I'm looking for, say, a particular cookie in an HTTP session, you know, that cookie may be sliced into two different TCP Exactly, segments. exactly. And that's by doing session-based APF, we would be able okay, to so you, do you can grip on flows then rather than packets? Not currently, but yes, we will have. Once, once that's yeah. enabled, yes. Got it. Thank you. So do you currently see, sorry, um, customers with a server collecting like PCAP sent in addition to this stuff? So would you say, well, actually using their infrastructure, we want to just kind of capture this conversation here and then use the infrastructure to kind of move it off? And yeah, th this is a way in terms of you know, greatly narrowing the scope of what exactly needs to be collected rather than you know, um, sending irrelevant data uh, to, to the destination. Yeah, they're not showing you the data at all. They're just saying yeah. they're This is what I'm trying to get my head around. So it's literally packet by packet, which is where it's going with it. So let's say if I had a, um, a server that was just running like a PCAP collector or something like that, then using um, the, the, the Gigamon hardware, we could say, right, I'm going to collect this conversation and let the hardware pick that out of, of, of the madness for me. Yep. That's what we're saying. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a question here as well. No. no. That was that was sort of related, so we're good. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks so. <laughs> so, what can a tap and act product really deliver, which is basically repurposed Ethernet switch, right? It's really a fancy way of doing header filtering and then replicating that to the tools. That's about it, right? None of the other session level traffic intelligence that we talked about is possible because, by definition, an Ethernet switch is stateless, right? And to put this in perspective, Consider this. We all know that every switch and router has got an access control list. But that doesn't make it a firewall. Right? And the same way, just because there's a tap and act capability that's there as a feature in a repurposed Ethernet switch does not make it a full visibility node. Yeah, there's certain you know, marginal use cases where that can, be, uh, that can be useful, but that's about it. If you want to have the full range of visibility, we believe that all of these things are important. So if you want to recap, a tap and act solution versus a real, true, pervasive visibility fabric. The limited header filtering, yep, both of them can pretty much you know, do both of them. Um, you can't have secure taps, uh, whether it's physical or virtual. You can't have deep packet filtering, like the you know, content-based filtering that we talked about. You can't do any kind of packet optimizations. You can't do any kind of stateful correlation because that's inherently stateless. You can't do any high performance net flow. You can't do any inline tool support. So it's a highly restricted, very narrow point of view that also takes a very box by box by box node centric view as opposed to something which looks at it very holistically. Right? I think that's a very critical point that we need to understand here. And with that, I'll transition in terms of how we deliver those promises that I talked about through our, our portfolio. This is probably the last slide where you'll actually see products being shown. Okay? And this is probably the last slide where you'll see the smattering of orange being shown in front of you. What you see here is pretty simple. <clears throat> There's a way to acquire the traffic. That's what taps and aggregators are meant for. So if you're looking for doing this in mega scale data centers, where you want to be looking at every single rack, every single physical um, you know, top of rack switch that needs to be monitored. That's exactly what this TA1 is meant for. It actually goes in there. right? Number two, if you want to be looking at any virtual traffic, that's what the VM solution is meant for. When you want to aggregate this to, to a higher level of aggregation before delivering that to the recipient of the information, that's what the HC2 or you know, these various other nodes are meant for. But the most important thing of all is the services that we offer, and we'll step through each one of these. The way in terms of how you select the flows that need to be filtered and sent for advanced processing, that's what is meant by flow mapping. Gigasmart is the acron is the name that we use for the technology which encapsulates all the things that we do as far as traffic intelligence. And we are very, very unique in that. All of you are familiar with the concept of service chaining that's used in networking. Remember that these are not independent functions. You can actually chain them together like a service chain exactly is what you would be expect to do in a service chain in a configuration. Number three is the management. Now, once you have, once you have a distributed architecture, you want to have a uniform way of managing all of this. Now, there's a web interface, which is what is called as 
hedge view. And there's also the fabric manager, which allows, so the hedge view allows you to have a web interface to a single device. That's pretty useful for you know, somebody who wants to start off with a single node installation, for example. But as your visibility fabric begins to grow, fabric manager is the way in terms of how you would manage across all of these nodes, whether it's physical or virtual, be able to manage this traffic intelligence, et cetera. And lastly, I think uh, Peter also talked about the integration with um, uh, external orchestration systems that's currently in, in a prototype fashion. And these are what we call as the traffic applications. Right now, if you combine, and, and that's also delivered through Gigasmart, the four key ones that we have today are deduplication, NetFlow generation, FlowView, which allows you to have a subscriber-specific view, as well as GTP correlation, that's a specific application that's done for mobile providers. Okay. Now with that, let's talk about one of the foundational elements of um, how uh, we select the flows. And this is something which Gigamon pioneered um, with a technology that we call as flow mapping. Flow mapping is essentially being able to select flows of interest and deliver them and replicate them to the tools. What, the way we do that is by first admitting all the flows and then depending on where the matches happen as far as the map rules are concerned, we send them to the respective tools and replicate them if required. How do you differentiate between those applications today? How do you differentiate between those applications today? Okay, these, um, so these app, effectively the map rules would have um, any filters based on layer two to layer four information, and that's what helps you to identify you know, which ones are of interest. Okay. okay. So replication to multiple tools, that's done here. Um, typically this is done based on what the specific you know, destination wants to see, right? So this is, um, I would say, a critical building block. So in the subsequent slides, you'll actually see flow mapping that is juxtaposed with um, you know, something else. And that something else is the traffic intelligence which is done. <clears throat> we also have the ability to replicate this to multiple uh, instances of the same tool. Um, um, you know, for example, maybe you've got a video analyzer, which um, this actually shows wipe. Um, it actually can be done for any of the tools. You may have multiple instances of them across which you want load balance, right? Uh, because the tools can't keep up with it, and that's fine. We have the ability to replicate that as well. Now, keep in mind that these are configurable hardware-based rules that are bound to ingress ports with one exception, and that exception is, of course, when you're doing it in a VM solution, there's no hardware there, so that's implemented in software. But otherwise, for the hardware-based products, all of this is done at line rate, and there's no dropping of packets which happens at the ingress. Okay? Um, I, I, I stress that because uh, it's important to note that, um, especially in security applications, uh, there's a very high level of sensitivity to, uh, is there any traffic that's getting dropped? Because you know, a single drop packet can mean you know, kind of a backdoor entry for, um, for a miscreant. So with that, I'm going to pause here and then transition over to Noam to do the first of the three demos. Uh, he'll start by talking about a quick overview of the setup, demonstrate flow mapping in action, and then I'll come back and talk about some of the other traffic intelligence uh, quick questions. Question. Yes, sir. For the, for the VM-based solution, yeah. is that a standalone product, or do you need the hardware appliance to aggregate like, the VM data? Great question. So um, I'm yet to come across a customer who has got a 100% virtualized environment. So typically the, the pain point that the customer is trying to solve towards is um, a correlation between um, what is happening in the virtual environment as well as the physical. So the way the solution works is that we grab all the data from the various sources and correlate across all of them before sending it to the tools. So right now, that solution involves having um, a, a virtual um, um, a VM monitoring solution a node that is installed uh, co-resident with the application. And then it works uh, hand in glove with the uh, traffic intelligent node. Is it actually installed on the v on the host? It's or installed on the, on the host, that's right. Yes. And, and Sage should be talking about that in more detail.